I have to say, I believe whatever is happening to Fugetsu might be a side effect of trying to leave the ship. A restriction placed by the succession war that you can't leave unless you get got like what she's going through now. That is an interesting idea. So my hypothesis in the chapter review was that Fugetsu was cursed by one of Camilla's have-nots. However, this idea is worth exploring because when Kacho and Fugetsu tried to escape, one of Kacho's final thoughts on this world was, leaving the ship doesn't mean escape but death. And I guess Fugetsu did technically leave the ship, so her death may not be as instantaneous as Kancho's, but this could still be some form of punishment for breaking the conditions of the succession war. A much more slow acting punishment. I mean, I say much more. She's practically dead and it's only been a couple of days, so that, that's still pretty fast. But if that is the case, I think Fugetsu's chances of living are even worse than if she would have been cursed by one of Camilla's legion, because this whole contest is one big invocation of post-mortem Nen. The succession war and the seed urn that facilitates it are all fueled by the former kings of Kakin, as well as hundreds, maybe even thousands of former princes that have been sacrificed for the good of the kingdom since its inception. That also may go some way towards explaining the phenomena that Fugetsu is, in a mechanism that I'm going to describe as somehow, actually getting more powerful as her life force drains. Most notably, she now seems to be able to use Secret Door both ways without Kacho and several times a day. Although here is another sinister possibility. Fugetsu may be doing this to herself. She may be quite literally cursing herself. Because using Secret Door costs a colossal amount of aura to use, at least comparatively to what Fugetsu can generate. So if she's using this door multiple times per day, then she could be quite literally killing herself by spending more life force than she can generate. And it's truly tragic because Fugetsu believes that she's doing all of this to protect Kacho, who has already died to protect Fugetsu, who is now about to die to protect Kacho. Sort of like a reverse Romeo and Juliet. They killed themselves because they thought the other was dead. But in this in this case, Kacho and Fugetsu may both be dying to ensure the life of the other, which just ends up in double death. Instead of double life, double life would have been much more preferable. It's not too dissimilar from how Gon used his own Nen during the palace invasion, pushing himself beyond his limits, but in a very self-destructive way. And of course, Gon also essentially placed a Nen curse on himself that took the power of a dark continent calamity to exercise. So look, I'm not as convinced anymore that this curse is definitely Camilla's doing. I still think it's a strong chance because everything lines up with the have-nots, but it could also be punishment for leaving the contest arena. Or it could even be Fugetsu cursing herself. Whichever one it turns out to be though, it's still a curse, which is a problem because Nen Exorcists are in very short supply. I am so happy to see that apparently some of Kacho's conscience has survived in her guardian beast. She cares so much for her sister that she doesn't even care about her own death. It's always interesting to see what I'm going to refer to as an anthropomorphized Nen beast. And it's not unprecedented. In fact, the first thought that comes to my mind is Bisky's masseuse named Cookie. She was a completely humanoid Nen beast, but even then this lingering will of Kacho is on a completely different level. For all intents and purposes, it is a self-aware Nen clone. And that would bring up all sorts of identity questions but also technically this is another use of post-mortem Nen. So I do wonder if the Kacho clone has any sort of enhanced abilities or if that post-mortem nature is currently what's impacting Fugetsu. Remembering that without you and Secret Door are linked abilities. But part of me really thinks that Togashi is setting us up for some pretty hard hitting tragedy here. With Fugetsu already having somewhat experienced the death of Kacho, this may end up being quite the sickening fate if the Nen Kacho then goes on to witness the death of Fugetsu. Like conjuring the ultimate impossible scenario for despair where both of them need to experience the other one dying. And I believe that if Fugetsu dies, then the Nen Kacho disappears because the conditions for without you are stipulated until death. I think it would be cool if the bodyguards and staff playing along with the roles Prince Tyson gave them started to actually become those identities and gained powers accordingly. Like the hitman that only remembers how to use a gun or the alien guy, he could probably have some crazy powers. So that's a very interesting idea because that's the thing about Nen. It responds to a person's need, desires and emotions. And very notably Prince Tyson's guardian spirit beast directly manipulates the latter. It's an emissive type that grants happiness to followers of Tyson in exchange for their aura. I believe Izunavi actually likened it to a spirit bomb from Dragon Ball. So Tyson, admittedly unknowingly, is siphoning off the life force of her followers to increase her own personal power. Which I guess is kind of in line with Tyson's mission of love changing the world, because the love and devotion of her followers is making her very powersome. But with this emotional Nen manipulation, if her bodyguards were to become Nen users, 
then naturally they would develop abilities based on what they think would help Tyson the most. And right now what best suits Tyson for the bodyguards is to play the roles they've been assigned. Like Madwig, the amnesiac assassin who looks shockingly like fourth Prince Aradnik, but he could develop an ability to say conjure a Nen gun, but every bullet he fires erases a memory from his mind. But he's happy to do that because Prince Tyson's Nen beast is directly manipulating his happiness. But even without Nen, I think that these guards are in real danger of losing themselves. Because again, the more devoted they are, the more happiness they receive in return. And I've been told that happiness is good, a good feeling. I have yet to experience it. Black or dark. <laughs> but eventually, surely most people would choose to take the path that makes them the happiest, even if it means abandoning what they are. And thus Tyson's bodyguards would just maybe start to live the role. But that's another reason why I'm very skeptical of Tyson. Her whole gimmick is about storytelling and role play. All of her guards have a very specific part in Tyson's reverse harem play. So when I see her having a genuinely opening and emotional moment in chapter 400, the skeptic in me just has to wonder if this is also all part of the play. I'm not saying she's some grand evil mastermind or even evil at all. I just don't trust that this situation is as straightforward and innocent as it's being presented to us. Because Tyson is, at heart, a storyteller. And in this chapter, she certainly does tell a very good story. One convincing enough that Izanavi is now, for his own reasons, pretty set on having the king read the book of Tyson. And as I mentioned in the chapter review, he is now an accidental disciple of Tyson. So Longi revealed that they were already a Nen user to Karapika. This is huge because in theory, they would be the fourth user Furikov noticed in the room, making them the most likely user of Silent Majority. All right, I don't wanna to get too deeply into this because Silent Majority is, <laughs> well, it's a big topic. It's the sort of thing that really does need a video of its own. It's a confusing but stupidly intriguing ability that's happening right now. But this commenter is very potentially correct. In chapter 372, we spent a lot of time inside the mind brain of Furikov, who identified a series of secret Nen users attending Karapika's class. And the final one, which was not made known to us as readers, was the user who Fyodikov deduced is most likely to be the silent majority assassin. And with the revelation that, oh, Longi is already a Nen user, how about that? Then that would set us up for a pretty one-to-one -one correlation. And just as a slight recap, Longi is of course one of fifth prince to Beppa's bodyguards and one of the two that was sent to Karapika's Nen class along with Mayor. However, Mayor was definitely not a Nen user prior to the classes and Prince to Beppa herself was unaware of Nen prior to the contest which means that no matter what, Longi has been keeping secrets. Now that's important because the user of Silent Majority has a hit list of people that were given to them, which I imagine wouldn't have been given by Tebepa because she obviously didn't know about Nen. If she doesn't know about Nen, she can't know about Silent Majority. And if she doesn't know about Silent Majority, she can't write out a list of people to kill. So that would potentially imply that Longi is working on behalf of someone else. However, and I really want to stress this, that is only if Longi is the user. And I'm not gonna lie, it's been an awful long time since I went over the whole silent majority situation so I can't pull all of the details off the top of my head, but this is a potentially groundbreaking development that only signifies further danger for Karapika. Are Melody in danger? Not my favorite character, please. Uh, yeah, Melody are in danger. So, so much danger. That's why the Justice Bureau is currently holding her in custody. Because as soon as she gets out, then those printers will immediately pounce. Some may pounce like friendly cats wanting friendly pats, whilst others will pounce like more combat trained attack cats. I mean, in chapter 400, it's even said that the first prince has guards stationed right outside waiting for Melody. And I don't think they'd kill her, at least, at least not immediately. Because right now, Melody is more like some sort of coveted weapon. Most of the princes are interested in using her, but also they probably fear her being used against them. So Melody is a massive target right now, potentially even more of a target than Karapika, which is very impressive because that boy went to a whole lot of effort to make himself the focal point of this entire contest. On a bit of a meta note though, I also think that this is a really cool use of the Melody character because she is one of the very few people in this series who is just pure and good and nice and stuff. And I like her, don't, don't do bad things to Melody, or else someone's gonna have strong words on the internet. But that's why using her in this sort of twisted assassination plot makes for very good drama. Togashi needs to add boxes to characters with their names and group info on them. I keep forgetting who is who at this point. That's fair enough. And that's something I really love about One Piece actually. It's a series with literally over a thousand characters. So the author very frequently makes use of both introduction and perhaps more frequently reintroduction boxes and text and stuff to make sure that the readers always know who's who. And sometimes even 
even to make them know that who's who is actually who's who. Yes, there's a character named who's who. Because when you have over a thousand characters, you, you start running out of names and you need to name people after just basic pronouns. To be honest though, I don't know if this approach would work as well for Hunter Hunter. I mean, yes, it would convey information in a more clear way, but I think it might risk breaking the immersion a bit. This idea works well for One Piece because it's a fun, wacky world where anything goes, but Hunter Hunter is a more grounded story. And I think that excessive text overlays could make us very aware of the hand of the author, which I don't personally want. I just want to be immersed into this particular world. Even if that means often forgetting these characters and needing to go back and find out who they are. With all that's happening, I truly do wonder if we will ever see our green broccoli boy gone. I mean, I miss him. Yeah, so I wouldn't count on seeing gone anytime soon. But to get your broccoli fix, here is Brocco Lee, the boss of the Char R family who has an infinitely greater chance of appearing soon in the manga as opposed to gone. So I hope that this has satisfied your broccoli craving. Will Hisoka interact with any of the princes if he goes to tier one? I would absolutely love that but I doubt it. The princes are just so damn hard to gain access to, and the Succession War isn't an event that's particularly friendly to Hisoka's very aggressive abilities, with the exception of the ever sneaky texture surprise. But really, this war is more about stuff like remote controlling cockroaches to spy on all of your enemies. But if there is one prince I could see Hisoka interacting with, it is definitely Tyson, because she would be absolutely smitten with our very pretty murder clown. She would go insane for him. The rest of the princes are uh, probably not. I really don't call this a real hiatus. The way they announced it was more of a change of release schedule than a proper hiatus, which is of course great. So to clarify, this is only a hiatus because we have no official return date. Although the word hiatus is very broad, in fact, a series can go on hiatus for only a single week. But I agree, this is not a hiatus in the Hunter Hunter meaning of the word. We're more or less in a transitional period where Togashi and his staff are trying to figure out a method of manga productionment that is both consistent and caters to Togashi's health needs, which again is much better news than we've had in the past where the announcement was just, and we're on hiatus now, full stop. And this one in particular is a great chance to reread the Succession War before we dive into the next batch of chapters, because chapter 400 even threw me off. There was so much Prince stuff that I had just pushed to the back of my mind. And all of a sudden it was like, oh yeah, there's that subplot over here and there's that subplot over there and they're meeting in the middle. And the scary thing is as much as 400 really tried to cram in, it doesn't even really scratch the surface of all of the princely doings. I mean, Benjamin, Camilla, Sarajnik, Hawkenberg, Mariam and Luzerus, all of these are genders, more than half of the prince is still remaining to be checked in with again. All of them having their own unique threads that we're in theory meant to be following. I mean, I say in theory because, because let's be real. It's hard to retain all of that information over a long period of time. So while unfortunate, this is not an entirely unwelcome hiatus. I think the last chapters have given us a lot to work with and think about, and I very much look forward to making a ton of Hunt Hunt videos whilst we wait for the inevitable return of the series.